Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karen Minkle, Director of the Home Region Program at the Walton Family Foundation. Thank you for joining us to have a conversation about the Arkansas and Mississippi Delta. I hope you've enjoyed the past two days of this conference. Personally, it has been inspiring to have national experts, community leaders, and our grantees all on the same virtual stage, sharing knowledge and leading the way in finding the solutions to the problems we hope to address together. I'm honored to have several partners join us to talk about the power of coalition building in rural communities. Now, before we jump in, I want to share the framework for the Foundation's strategic plan, how it informs our work in the Delta and our approach for the region over the next year. As I'm sure you've heard over the last couple of days, the Foundation's new strategic plan is a reflection of our mission, tackling tough social and environmental problems with urgency and a long-term approach to create access to opportunity for people and communities. The Foundation will work in three areas, improving K-12 education, protecting rivers and oceans and the communities they support, and investing in our home region of Northwest Arkansas and the Arkansas and Mississippi Delta. As you can imagine, these are unique areas of work, but there are three shared values that will function as connective tissue across all programs. The first is championing community-driven change to ensure our work reflects the voices and needs of the communities we support. The second is prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion in our grant making and the voices we engage. And finally, collaborating with partners to develop innovative approaches that bring people, resources, and ideas together in ways that can be scaled. For the home region, that means honoring the Walton family's longstanding commitment to Northwest Arkansas and the Arkansas Mississippi Delta. So how will these shared values inform our approach in the Delta? We are using 2021 as an exploratory year to better understand how our support can be most impactful. And to that end, we are engaging in conversations with a diverse set of stakeholders, including many of you, to talk more about education and youth engagement, economic asset building for individuals and families, and coalition building to maximize resources and expertise. And when we started brainstorming this session, we knew of several efforts to build effective coalitions in the Delta and saw the impact of coalitions developed in other rural communities across the country. Now, as we've heard during the last two days, and we'll hear more about today, partnerships, coalitions, and collaboration are often vital to developing and implementing solutions that benefit our communities. Now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Kim Davis, who I'm sure many of you know from his work in the Delta and his many, many visits to the region. Now, while work is his excuse, I know the real reason he loves to visit is his deep admiration and love for the people doing the work in the Delta communities. Kim is a senior advisor to the Home Region Program and leads our efforts in the Delta. Thank you, Karen. It's a privilege to work with such a dynamic leader. And you're exactly right. There are a lot of things that I love about the Delta. The people are driving me back there over and over and over and over again, and I just love it. Although I gotta admit, uh, the sweet potato and coconut cream pie at Miss Lena's Pie Shop in Duvall's Bluff is a good reason to go to the Delta. Uh, and, and I call it a shop very loosely because in all honesty, when you enter into the shop, you are walking into Miss Lena's home kitchen. But I digress. Today, we're gonna to hear from people who understand firsthand the impact that coalition building can have on rural communities. They represent local, state, national coalitions designed to create better outcomes for the communities they serve. And after we hear from each of our speakers, we'll take some time to answer questions from the audience. First, we'll hear from Abby Hosclaw, Senior Director at the Asset Funders Network. Abby has a range of experience in philanthropic and nonprofit sectors. In her work with Asset Funders Network, she leverages a coalition of national funders focused on building economic well being for all. Abby, it's all yours now. Thank you so much, Kim. 
And thank you to the Walton Family Foundation for asking me to be part of this important launch. It is said, and we believe, that many hands make lighter work. Together, through diverse, influential coalitions where philanthropy is agile and flexible, we can meet moments presented to us, answer calls to action, and collectively be the positive forces of change we imagine. But the way philanthropy usually works is problematic. Philanthropy as usual often invests in groups to form coalitions and tasks those same groups with the burden of coordinating, managing, and operating the coalition. However good intentioned, this model can further exacerbate capacity and staffing issues our nonprofit partners, leading to their burnout, distrust, and sometimes reduced impact. Nonprofit partners need to be freed to build their capacity to do what they do best and lean in to their respective missions without already adding another layer of coalition operations and management to their already full agenda. In Arkansas, we're approaching things differently, using the agility and flexibility of funders to provide coalition infrastructure and capacity building to leverage the strengths of our community partners and have greater impact. We are disrupting the philanthropy as usual approach and have three different coalition models I'd like to share with you today to prove it. These coalition models emerged from important moments, powered by intermediary organizations that can absorb the coalition management and operational burdens while partner organizations are freed up to deliver strategy. One coalition was born from a crisis, the COVID funders table. Another coalition was born from research, the 2020 census coalition. And the last example from the longer term desire that our Kansans are able to build financial stability and assets. Bank on Arkansas Plus Coalition. All three share disruption tactics that created the space, trust, and support for philanthropy and nonprofit partners to achieve impact together. All were focused on agile philanthropy, leading in the moment with buy-in and participation of partners. Arkansas Impact Philanthropy and the Arkansas Asset Funders Network formed the funders COVID table to meet the crisis of the moment of the pandemic, working together to fill critical gaps in need. Responding to research and data telling us that hard to count populations in Arkansas were literally not going to be counted in the census, AIP stepped up to form Arkansas Counts and launch a statewide campaign to promote the 2020 census. And in my third example, Arkansas Asset Funders Network uniquely invested in a statewide model, the Bank on Arkansas Plus model, to ensure that people have access to mainstream financial services and build assets to buffer them from financial storms. These three coalitions share similar ingredients that increase their success. And the tactics, they're the real heroes of this story. First, someone woke up each day and owned it. That person, lovingly and often referred to as a coordinator, was resourced by grant makers and charged with building the scaffolding that allowed partners to move freely and do their work. Owning it meant recentering the coalition back into focus time and again when faced with distractions. Owning it also meant providing ongoing technical assistance, guiding needed pivots, brokering expertise, and speaking two languages, philanthropy speak and nonprofit speak. The coordinator owned carrying the load of management while partners owned shaping the agenda and carrying out the strategy. We know local nonprofits already have capacity issues. To add a coalition list would not only be unfair, it would be a question of equity. Second, these coalitions all had regular meetings that allowed for deeper relationship building, 
between and among funders and partners, leading to trust, resource sharing, and informed collective needs. Regular touch points, even when they turned virtual, help build a shared purpose, an emphasis on common narratives, and elevate a common North Star goal to direct resources and strategies. Third, centralized coordination allowed us to eat and national data consistently across all respective networks to inform our decision making and help us amplify consistent and coherent messaging. Finally, each coalition truly worked for statewide impact. We really meant it. We didn't just have a lofty goal of focusing statewide. Our statewide approaches created momentum, brought in new voices and partners to share expertise. It also is just a more equitable way of doing business to ensure that all parts of Arkansas were included and their voices were guiding our strategy. These four common ingredients in the coalitions also yielded some impressive results. In the response to COVID, funders have collectively invested $16 million at last count in Arkansas organizations for relief, recovery, and rebuilding. The Arkansas Counts campaign can celebrate that 99.9% .9 of Arkansas households were counted in the 2020 census. And funders co-invested over 850,000 to support census outreach and awarded over half a million dollars to Arkansas organizations. The Bank on Arkansas Plus Coalition has been lauded as a national model. Arkansas can boast that it hosts the most financial institutions of any other state with certified bank on account. And to date, over 45 nonprofits have helped 6,000 people open safe bank accounts. There are issues and moments we can anticipate, and there are those we cannot predict. Part of having agility means ongoing investment to foster and nurture vital relationships you know you need or you think you may need while also laying the groundwork for infrastructure models that can be deployed at any point with room to include emerging partners. This is new philanthropy. It's agile, it's flexible, and responsive. So I ask you, as philanthropy, are you listening and supporting moments for coalition building? Are you prepared to deploy resources that give those coalitions the fuel to go? As nonprofits, are you willing to guide and lean into your mission alongside new philanthropy? This is our version of new philanthropy as usual in Arkansas, and we're excited for the journey to see where it takes us next. Thanks, Kim, and back to you. Thanks a lot, Abby. You know, the work that you are doing is so critically important. And I think there are a lot of jewels that Abby dropped along the way, right? This idea of coalitions of the moment. And so I'm sure we're going to have a number of follow-up questions when we get to our panel. Thanks again. Next, we're going to hear from Ryan Watley with Go Forward Pine Bluff, an initiative fo focused on a multifaceted city approach to coalition building. Go Forward Pine Bluff brings together education, local government, economic development, and quality of life initiatives as it's having a positive impact on the city of Pine Bluff in Arkansas. Ryan will talk to us about his work building coalitions across a complex community. Ryan, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Kim, and I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, excited to be here. Thanks again to the Walton Family Foundation for uh, inviting me. Um, I want to take this time to introduce a complex set of challenges. It's the year 2016, and the following conditions are provided to you about the city of Pine Bluff. Pine Bluff has one of the worst unemployment rates in Arkansas and highest among the state's metropolitan areas. Pine Bluff has three school districts. outlook. A significant deterioration in the city's residential and commercial 
killed compounded by property neglect, absentee ownership. And the city contends with over 450 condemned, abandoned, or torn down residential properties. Multiple vacant stores and shopping centers and the conventional mall is losing major retailers. Only 10% of the revenues by the Pineville Convention Center come from events held at the facility. The remaining money it needs to rate comes from the city's tax. Additionally, the 200-room hotel adjacent to the convention center is closed. Census report shows that the city has lost 16% in inflation since 1970, and it is predicted to lose an additional 6,000 residents by 2020. The state's overall negative perception of Palm Bluff is largely shared by its citizens, who cite commercial and residential decline and education as their two top concerns, followed by crime and a lack of activities for adults and children. While these conditions may have materialized over decades, they must be turned around in short order. In a traditional word problem fashion, you are then asked, please provide a solution that takes into the account of social economic context of the residents. While this could be a simulated exercise and a platform for great discussion, this actually happened in Pine Bluff, and it was apparent leaders had to provide a quick solution. As a result, Go For it Pine Bluff was born. Throughout 8,000 hours of discussion, planning amongst young, black, old, white, collar, and blue collar, to address the downward spiral and in financial resources to bring about sweeping change and merely just address the issue at hand. This process established Go For Palm as a coalition of coalitions divided into four pillars of economic development, quality of life, education, and government infrastructure. The plan was developed and revealed to the public However, there was a great deal of mistrust and lack of confidence that had to be overcome because past efforts did not bring about results. While this plan had 26 broad-based initiatives, there had to be many community, initi community meetings to explain the in-depth approach to bring about change. Fast forward to the year 2021 and we have passed a sales tax and raised private funds to engage or complete 80% of those 26 initiatives. The work has brought about significant intangible and tangible results for the city of Pine. You can feel and see the difference, yet we have so far to go. Looking back on the initial conditions, the coalition of coalitions has helped to accomplish the following. Beginning June 1 of 2021, there will no longer be three school districts, but there will be two, which will provide access to resources needed to support the challenge. The Education Coalition has also worked to establish a Teach Pine Bluff model, which incentivizes and increases the number of quality teachers within the city of Pine Bluff. The Pine Bluff Urban Renewal Agency was created with a systemic approach for the remediation of blight, and on a daily basis, urban renewal agency can be seen rehabbing commercial properties and raising residential properties that are beyond repair. A minimum 2,500 jobs are expected to be added to the Pine Bluff economy by year 2024. And a technology servicing company has signed a lease to move in one of the largest commercial buildings in downtown. This will support population growth. The 200-room hotel has been acquired by the city. And they, as they understand that the success of the convention center hinges on the ability to have a functioning hospitality arm to recruit conventions. The city is currently considering development, a development agreement for the hotel. The state's overall perception is improving about Pine Bluff, which is why I may be on this call. However, residents still say we have so far to go, but they are believing Pine Bluff is a better place to live and that it, that it ever has been because it is becoming more inclusive and amenable to diverse walks of life. Fortunately, 
used to. There are many mess about the work going on in Pine Bluff. The question lies, why was it different this time? The Go For It Pine Bluff movement was actually incorporated into a nonprofit GFPB Inc. Human and financial resources were dedicated to driving the coalition of coalitions. We are a three person team, internal team, that absolutely work well with others to get the work done. One thing about being a dedicated driving force is that everyone will point to you for consideration of issues that arise. But what we essentially want, but that is what we essentially want. However, we get some of the credit, but all of the blame, and we must continue to remind the coalition that Mission Creek will destroy us. To remain centered on the plan and move forward in that direct manner. This has been very challenging work, yet rewarding, and we remain fortunate to be able to make a difference in the city of Pine Bluff. Thank you, Kim, and back to you. Thanks a lot, Ryan, and thanks for all the good work that's happening in the city of Pine Bluff. It's a real complex system bringing together public, bringing together educational, bringing together economic development leaders together to move a city forward. And your organization has done a fantastic job. Now we'll hear from Sammy Moon, Executive Director with the Mississippi Alliance for Nonprofits and Philanthropy. Sampy has led amazing work in bringing together a statewide coalition of funders, nonprofit organizations, helping break down the grantor-grantee power dynamic. Sammy, please bless us with some gems today. Uh, thank you so much, Kim. Um, I don't know how many gems I'll have, but we'll throw out what we've got. Um, I'm so honored and humbled to have been asked uh, to be part of this. So I thank you. I thank Karen and the rest of the team at the Walton Family Foundation for putting on this event and for inviting us to participate. Uh, appreciate it very much. Uh, as Kim said, we have probably taken what Abby was talking about to the extreme here in Mississippi. Abby spoke about uh, philanthropy and nonprofits coming together and working together in different ways and laid out models uh, in Arkansas where that has happened. We in Mississippi have done that, and as I say, we probably have taken it to the extreme in that we have built a new business model with the Alliance of Nonprofits and Philanthropy that basically blows up the old way of working and is set in place to try to minimalize the inherent power dynamics and privilege dynamic that historically has driven philanthropic and nonprofit relationships. So I wanna take just a, a little bit of time to tell you about what we've done to lay out the what we did, why we did it, how we did it, and what we've learned so far, and begin by saying I love the title of coalition work in rural communities. I think coalition work, however, applies not only to rural communities, but to urban communities and all communities in between, because uh, I think as Karen noted in her video remarks, coalition building leads to collaboration. So. When I look up the definition of coalition, it's to come together, and we do absolutely want to do that. To collaborate, then, the definition is to cooperate. So we come together to cooperate, and we add the last phrase about we're coming together to cooperate toward mutually agreed upon results. So what we've done with the Alliance is we, like most places in the country, had two organizations, one that was siloed and working to provide services and supports to nonprofits. It was called the Mississippi Center for Nonprofits. We also had a separate siloed organization that was working with philanthropy called the Mississippi Association of Grant Makers. As we began working together and talking with each other and listening to each other in ways that had not happened before, we began to understand that there is no 
reason why we should be in separate siloed organizations. So basically what we did after two years plus worth of planning is we blew up those two existing organizations, put them out of business, and merged philanthropy and nonprofits into the new, newly created organization called the Alliance of Nonprofits and Philanthropy. So we have created a new structure, a new process, a new way of working, and I usually talk about it as a new business model that says we are in this together. We're learning, we're sharing, we're uh, integrating work and, and working together rather than separately. Why did we do it? Because what we kept hearing was frustration on both parts. We kept hearing from nonprofits that we have trouble even finding out who to talk to in the world of philanthropy. You know, we're trying to figure out how to talk about something other than the hoops we need to jump through to get money. Uh, we would like to talk about, you know, strategy. We would like to talk about actions. We would like to talk about evaluation models. But all we get to do is talk about the hoops we need to jump through. On the other hand, we were hearing from philanthropy, I'm having trouble finding uh, nonprofits that have the capacity to deliver on what we need them to deliver on. So I'm struggling in, 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 in that, that uh, capacity of trying to figure out who do I need to have a relationship. So to us, there was this epiphany moment, and now I look at it and I think that really wasn't an epiphany, it was just a duh moment of saying, then why are we working in separate silos? Why aren't we coming together? Why aren't we building a model that says we are learning, we are sharing, we are communicating, we are looking at common results and figuring out ways to achieve those common results together. So that, in effect, was the epiphany that led to two years worth of planning to create the Alliance of Nonprofits and Philanthropy. Uh, we did that. I mentioned a planning grant. The Kellogg Foundation was wonderful in supporting us for two years while we went through this very thorough strategic process. We brought on a project manager that was critical in handling the logistics and working the process of, of planning and figuring out what would work and what wouldn't work. We did a whole round of best practice research to see who else in the country has done uh, this kind of uh, bringing the two siloed sectors together. Uh, we did a whole round of surveying and talking with <clears throat> our philanthropic and nonprofit members. We created a structure, a management team to do it. We laid out a vision, mission, and value statement. And I'll mention there that was critically important to do because when times got tough and it felt like it was going to fall apart, that's what held us together. We were able to go back to that mission and say, do we still believe in this? And is it worth working through what we got to work through? And the answer always came back, yes. So there was a whole series of steps that we went through to get there. Uh, we've been in existence now as the Alliance since April of 2019. Thus far, we have learned an awful lot uh, about what it is we're trying to do and, and getting much more grounded in the fact that it is indeed, in our estimation, the right thing to do. We are seeing different relationships develop. We're seeing different communications occurring. We're seeing conversations that we only dreamed about before happening among and between philanthropy and nonprofits. Uh, and so we, at this point, would encourage others to think about this. As far as we can tell, at this point, we're the only statewide entity, statewide entity in the country that has taken, you know, this radical step of saying we are formally putting the, the two together so that, that they are working together. Uh, some of the other couple learnings, uh, it's not a quick fix. It's going to take time. It takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of of greasing the skids, if you will, to get it to the point where it can actually happen. But I think the future is bright. I think that we see a really, a, a, a real value in doing what we did, what we've done. It, uh, it helps us keep a continuing, unrelenting focus on quality and customer service. 
It helps us build more external partnerships. It gives us year-round presence in both sectors. And again, I'm grateful to be able to talk about it. I'm happy to answer questions. And Kim, with that, I turn back to you. Thanks a lot, Sammy. Uh, every time we have a conversation, my friend, my basket gets full. So although you don't think there are dream, gems that are being dropped, you continue to do it every time. So I really appreciate that. Last, we'll hear from Takina Watson, a teacher at Kip Delta, her alma mater, and a 2020 Aspen Young Leaders Fellow. Takina is a rising star in the Delta region. She's a founding member of the Helena West Helena Racial Equity Task Force and will speak to us about building an active youth-based coalition to address the dynamics in her community. Takina, please, let's hear from you. Thank you so much to the Watson family for this opportunity and thank you, Kim, so much for that great introduction. So um, today what I'll actually do is start um, by discussing what I feel like is a piece of the root to my coalition building in the Delta, in the Mississippi Delta. And so there was a fellowship that I joined um, my senior year in college. It's the Aspen Young Leaders Fellowship. It focuses on developing young leaders between the ages of 17 and 22. So short story, in December of 2020, I met about 16 new people. Um, I probably knew about four of them, personally one. Um, so this is about 19 strangers. And so, in January of 2020, um, that was December of 2019. In January of 2020, next we were in the Ozarks and we were meeting a new set of friends from St. Louis. And so this was another cohort. And so all of us newly knowing each other, we stayed in the Ozarks for a weekend with no cell phone service. And we spent the weekend climbing mountains, doing some self-digging, understanding our traumas and ways, learning about the ways we can better contribute to society and unknowingly building the start to a new family and coalition and preparing us for some major tragedies that happened only a few months down the line. A global pandemic plus a racial and cultural divide. We left in January excited and hopeful, full, with a goal to liberate our communities through access and education. Who knew this session was just in time? The Aspen Young Leaders Fellowship, there's two cohorts, cohorts thus far, where at the time there were. Cohort one and cohort two join with our communities to plan marches, create action plans, and better understand the needs of our communities in both Mississippi and Arkansas. We supported one another and shared our love and media support for our St. Louis family. During this time, some of us were still actively fellows. A part of our fellowship was a community impact project where we were able to brainstorm an idea specifically on supporting the needs of our community and implement with training on working groups, Discussions from leaders across the country that have made huge impacts on their own communities, offering us advice and support with our plans. We were able to have forums on education, financial literacy, and mental health. We were able to offer free and discounted tutoring services, give the community access to the mental health services and free counseling that we offer in our community. Two of my classmates and I, we sought to create an organization called Helena West Helena for Change. This organization started as a means for everyone in our community to be able to receive and share information without implicit bias. We reached out to our mayor with our concern, concerns and we were able to start the Racial Equity Task Force. We have focused on creating a credit repair program with the bank. We have nationalized Juneteenth as a holiday and many of the abandoned buildings in my community are starting to be cleared and or restored. Right now, this coalition that we started at the Aspen Institute it, be, it lasted way beyond the Aspen Institute. Right now, we're working operations inside of schools. We're teaching students. We're working on policy. We're inside the school. We're in school, serving our communities each year. A Christmas community dinner serving over 200 plus people. Each Sunday, working with a nonprofit called Delta Rising, serving a different street or church, trying to create summer programs to enhance social emotional skills alongside with reading and math and supporting existing coalitions in their work for our communities by continuously trying to understand effective solutions for deeply rooted cultural issues. Teach Plus is where I'm personally able to learn more about the policy that directly affects my students and can see what's possible for me inside my classroom and inside the political realm. I'm able to give the state board and the school board recommendations firsthand as a teacher 
I'm the one who sees my students every day. And so my impact matters. My voice matters when it comes to policy that directly affects those students. I'm, again, giving those leadership skills and opportunities to write op-eds, complete focus groups, and engage in policy, and giving those language skills to be able to translate between regular language and political language. Thinking of students and investing into our community recreation means investing into programs such as Thrive, which helps many of our students be able to express themselves artistically through community murals. They should continue to be educated and given resources like leadership and conflict resolution training at Brown University in Davidson, where I spent my high school summer. All of these coalitions rooted me in this idea to continue to meet my different classmates and my different peers. And now the work we do across our community has the same goal. And the goal is to continue to better our community through access and education. With that, thank you, Kim, and we're back to you. Thanks, Takina. It, it really is amazing, and I get inspired every time I meet uh, young leaders like yourself and, and others in the Delta. You, you really have a special place uh, in my heart. I want to remind everybody that we'd love to get your uh, questions. So if you wouldn't mind, go to the chat. I don't know if it's on this side or this side, but please, let's put some questions in the chat for our speakers today. Um, they're really very willing and able to share some really dynamic information with you. Uh, Abby, I'd, I'd like to start with you. Uh, I'm interested in hearing how the kind of momentum, like how do you sustain the kind of momentum post-COVID? I mean, you talked about the idea of coalitions of the moment, uh, and, and, and they're critically important, right? I'd love to hear just a little bit more about sustaining the momentum post-COVID. It's a great question, Kim, and, and thank you. You know, we listen is part of it. I think that the infrastructure that has been built in each of the three examples, um, two of which, you know, are still ongoing as COVID has not gone anywhere and we're still in the midst of the pandemic, the funders are continuing to actually meet at least monthly and share. But I think the relationships um, will last beyond that, not only among the funders, but also explicitly with the grantees. And one of the ways we're working to really harness the momentum is to continue to bring folks together, to continue the communication where we listen and learn what partners are lifting up and elevating this critical need. Um, those conversations are actually a huge focus of quarter one and quarter two this year for funders. Thanks for that, Abby. Really appreciate it. Sammy, you, you talked about this idea of um, that, that power dynamic. How, what type of conversations happened around, particularly with funders, around uh, really relinquishing a little bit of that or sharing, that's a better way to say it, sharing that power dynamic? Uh, well, that's a, a very, very good question as well, Kim. And I will tell you, both from our research uh, that we had done prior to our journey, as well as what we've learned since we have flipped the switch and become the alliance, that is a, a fundamental mental question that people said you're, you, you're going to have to to deal with. And in fact, what what people that we were talking with said to us is, and there were several places across the country that had started down this journey of actually blowing up and creating something new. And they said it was usually philanthropy that pulled back and pulled out. And it was based on, you know, the fact that literally to do what we're trying to do, we are saying there's a new way of doing business that's not based on, you know, the privilege of having resources and you know, dealing with those that are looking for those resources, but it's based on what do we have in common and what are you trying to achieve philanthropy with the resources that you have? How can we play a role in matching you up with one or more nonprofits that are able to deliver to produce what you're trying to produce and then be a broker of a relationship though that you talk together, design together, plan together, share together, evaluate together and build a relationship so that you're both getting what you need rather than the old way of just creating an RFP, throwing it out there and hoping that somebody comes along. So one, I think there's the, the longer term, the longer term that it's going to take 
for people to get used to working differently together is one thing. So we're we're in it for the for the long haul. Uh, two, I think it's providing success along the way so that we build in those broker opportunities where we put people together consciously and strategically to have the conversations they need to have. And all of a sudden, the light bulbs go off and they say, oh, I don't know why we haven't been doing this before. And that has happened already. And then three, I think it's the continuing emphasis on um, reinforcing, you know, we're trying to do something fairly unique in the field here. And, you know, it's important for us to figure it out and just continuing reinforcing the messaging around that. So, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to be easy and it will never be, you know, uh, it'll never be the, the, uh, the ideal, but we certainly, I think, have to strive and work toward the ideal. Yeah, thanks for that. I really appreciate that. Takina, I want to go to you next. You talked about the opportunity for your cohort in the Delta to join and meet with the cohort, I think you mentioned in St. Louis. I'd be interested in hearing just a little bit more about what were you able to connect with by meeting with a cohort that may not have been based in the Delta? What learnings happened during those cohort meetings? Thank you. I think there were so many learnings that happened in that one event that prepared us for so many more events that were to come in the months later. Um, one thing, just a few more details. We stayed in a cabin. And so that's another thing. We're 17 to 22 and you're sleeping with complete strangers and you have no cell phone service. And so you have to talk to each other about something. Um, and so we realized really quickly that most of the issues or quote unquote issues that we felt like we had in the Delta were not, we were not alone. That was thing one for us. And it was a big thing for me. One, we were not alone. And two, there was nothing stopping us from solving some most of our issues together. And so sometimes their brainstorming and our brainstorming together just allowed us to like push our ideas beyond where we even thought they were possible in the beginning. Um, another thing that we did that I specifically was impactful during that experience, we um, meeting those different groups. We also did some unlearning and relearning about ourselves and our communities in the same time. And so um, a specific activity is called a breaking board. And so before you can be a leader for someone else, we specifically talk about taking care of yourself. And before they try to equip us with leadership skills, I do acknowledge that we were given the skills to take care of ourselves. And so we went through this process with, quote unquote, again, strangers of what do we have that we need to fix? What do our community have that we need to, quote unquote, fix? And from there, we just started brainstorming together. So again, it was the benefit of, Sometimes I may not have thought about this issue because they have just different predicaments in their city. But we all had the same issues and we all could work together. And ultimately, that's what it became. We still do work together just across different state lines. That is fantastic. I really appreciate that. Um, this next question, uh, we're going to go to Abby first. But Sammy, I'd like you to jump in on this when Abby finishes as well. So, Abby, um, and and I'm listening. I'm listening hard on this one. How do you deal with disparity in resource levels ar among grant makers in the coalition? Uh, I'd love to to kind of drill down on that a little bit. And then Sammy, I'm sure you've experienced some of that. The idea of disparities between grant makers in the coalition. So Abby, take it away. Oh, indeed. Uh, folks' checkbooks are and come in, in various sizes, right? You know, let me say first and foremost, I think that we all quickly go when we think about philanthropy to thinking about actual dollar resources. And so one of the things that I would lift up that is a common thread among the three coalition models I mentioned, both census, the COVID funders table and Bank on Arkansas Plus is that the funders that have been part of those groups have leveraged not only their financial support, but also their brand, their connections, and their influence. And at various points in time, depending upon what was needed to have impact, we've leaned in to those in ways that in many instances far surpassed what people could have put on the table dollar-wise. And it's been invaluable. 
Um, I'll give an example about the Census Coalition, for example. Um, you know, we had the uh, Women's Foundation of Arkansas, which continues to evolve and grow, that may have more limited financial dollar resources than, say, uh, the Walton Family Foundation or Walmart or Tyson Foundation that was at the table. But they were able to broker their relationships with state government leaders and specifically Governor Ava, Asa Hutchison to ultimately influence the development of a statewide complete count committee that just amplified our message while we were focused on hard to count populations. And it was leveraging uh, wonderful board member relationships that helped do some of that work. And so again, it's not just the financial resources that funders bring to the table, but I really encourage folks to think about um, no matter who's at the table, the fact that they maybe can't write the larger checks, they really do bring incredible value. And in each of our coalitions, we valued them all in the same way, not just the financial contribution they can make. I'm confident Sammy's got some lessons from Mississippi as well. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in and say a couple of things here. You know, and, and totally agree with, with Abby in terms of there's much more than just financial resources that get brought to the table. Uh, we, you know, in, in, in the work so far, we have not run into, I keep losing my, my earplug here, we have not run into this as a particular, particularly difficult issue to deal with. And I, I think there are a couple of reasons for that. One is the relationships, and Abby mentioned relationships as well. But, you know, as you know, in Mississippi and in Arkansas and in the South, everything is based on relationships. It's, it's, it's the, we know each other, we tell stories, we're, you know, we're probably kin to each other if you work it out far enough. So, you know, there, <laughs> there are these relationships and, and those get cultivated. So we have consciously built into our process the cultivation of those relationships, particularly among philanthropy and nonprofits and among philanthropists themselves, so that we try to minimize the fact of whether you're a $100 million foundation or you're a $30 million foundation uh, or less. Most of ours are less than that. But, you know, we, we try to build off those relationships of we're all, we know each other, we have a common purpose here, and that's the second thing that I think is really important to emphasize besides cultivating the relationships is working the results focus. Because, you know, if you come to a, an agreed upon set of results that you're working toward, it doesn't matter the level you're putting in because you're, you're using the resources you have to try to achieve that common set of results. So, you know, in the pooled funding work that we've done, for example, again, we've got people that have put money in from the $100 million down to the Small Family Foundation, but the decision-making uh, is built on relationships and built on, you know, we're, we're after results. So it's it's been a pretty democratic process so far. Now, we may run into challenges later on, but but those two things, in addition to what Abby said, I think are important. Well, thank you, thank you all so much for that. Um, from a from a from a man who grew up with a father from New Roads, Louisiana, a uh, little small community. I like to joke there hasn't been a new road in New Roads since 1950. Uh, you know, a, a man who has uh, grown up as the son of a mother from Sulphur, Louisiana, right, right outside of Lake Charles. I really want to thank you for all the work that you do for really small rural communities. And I look forward to definitely seeing you uh, as I travel throughout the Delta. Um, thank you again, Ryan, Abby, Takina, Sammy. What you share today is really invaluable to not only my work, but I know to the audience as well. These conversations, we need to keep going. They're invaluable to the Walton Family Foundation, and they're invaluable to make sure that we're working with community in order to get the best change for those communities that we really care about. So thank you again so much to the audience. Thank you, Sammy, Takina, Abby, Ryan.
Look forward to seeing you at Lena's Pie Shop. <laughs>